example, in 1954, the CIA, uh, 1953, the CIA uh, undermined the elected, democratically elected civilian government of the day of Mohammed Mossadegh, overthrew that government, installed the Shah as military dictator, and in the aftermath set up a service called the SAVAK. This service over the 25 years of the Shah's regime became famous for its torture chambers and its assassinations of the Shah's political opponents. Uh, 1954, the U.S., the CIA, intervenes in Guatemala, undermines the civilian government, the government is overthrown, and from 1954 on, Guatemala has had one succession of military rulers after another, a military dictatorship. In the aftermath of this operation in 1954, the CIA set up an internal security service, and then others. But from these services set up and supported by the CIA all through the years came the death squads. In other words, the services established by the CIA then spawned these death squads in Guatemala. The very same thing in El Salvador. You can be as sure as you are of your own name that for the last 10 or 11 years, the CIA has been working in there day and night with those Salvadoran security services and military, collecting information, giving it to those services, which in turn are the same things as the death squads, information on activists in the human rights field, the student leadership, uh, trade unions, and so forth. <clears throat> and those have constituted the 75,000 or so people who have been murdered over 10 or 11 years in El Salvador. Disappeared, many of them, others tortured to death, their bodies thrown along the sides of the roads. Nobody knows how many have been killed in Guatemala by these military regimes, uh, which started with the CIA. Some say 100,000, some say 125,000, some say 150,000. Who knows? Nobody will ever really know the, um, the exact number who have been killed. But you multiply this around the world, uh, because I'm only mentioning a couple of examples uh, of the CIA operations. There have been now 44 years of this, and they have existed all around the world. And put those operations together with the overt military interventions and the enormous cost in human life of those, such as Grenada, Panama, uh, Iraq, Vietnam, for example, all of those, and you get, to, you get the picture of this expansionist, extremely aggressive U.S. foreign policy. Well, I don't think it's enough, really, to describe what the CIA does or uh, U.S. foreign policy in general. It's also necessary to ask a couple of questions. And going back to the Gulf for just a moment, consider this analysis of what really happened in the Gulf. You know that the United States has been exporting war material for, uh, for decades, beginning right around 1950 with the document I mentioned earlier. Tanks, guns of every sort, weapons, planes, ships, and military equipment of every sort. Well, with a national debt of three and a half trillion dollars in this country, 800 billion of it owned by foreigners, for handling of that debt, it seems that it was only a matter of time before the U.S. armed forces were sent abroad as one more export because what we did in the Persian Gulf crisis was to send abroad that enormous amount of military hardware, but this time we also exported the people to operate it. It was armed forces sent abroad to protect the resources and the uh, regimes, these family dictatorships of the sheikdoms of the Persian Gulf. What we did, in fact, was what we in the United States do the best. We made war and we were financed in this exercise by the people who make things that people around the world want, cars, VCRs, and so forth, financed mainly by the Japanese and the Germans. And that puts the United States, as it's going to have a permanent presence in the Persian Gulf, in a very strong position vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese and the Germans who are not there militarily. And they are going to depend to a great degree for their energy resources, at least from that region, on U.S. policy. That is why they went along with the war. That is an interpretation of the Gulf crisis. And the other question that I wanted to raise is why we do these things as a country. Why we do these as a society, as a nation. Why do we do these grisly things abroad? I believe strongly that 
until we have fundamental change in the United States, domestically, in the domestic system, until we have some kind of real democracy in this country, participatory democracy, where people have a say, and where we end the re-election of 95 to 97 percent of incumbents at every election, where there is a real political debate, until we change the domestic system, we're going to have elitist control of the United States, we're going to have these foreign adventures and the grisly things, as I mentioned, that the CIA does abroad. So the real problem is here at home in changing the domestic system, in bringing about a conversion of the economy to human purposes, solving the domestic crises, and getting the people out of office who are in there to back a continuation of the permanent war economy. In Indonesia, you may well know the story about what the military regime has done to East Timor, but by chance, if even one of you doesn't know it, I'll tell it again, because that's really what it's going to take uh, for the situation to change, is that story told from one person to another, from one community to another, until people simply say they're not going to take it anymore. They're not going to let the U.S. government support these kind of regimes that are responsible for some of the worst genocides in the 20th century. Indonesia, um, under Suharto, uh, the military regime came to power in 65 in an incredible bloodbath. Uh, perhaps a half a million to a million people killed in Indonesia uh, with the support of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency because of the reporting of one uh, crusading journalist named Kathy Kadane who went to journalism school simply to write this article. She had met a CIA agent who had been working in Indonesia, and he talked about how the U.S. CIA made up lists of dissidents in Indonesia and gave them over to the military uh, under Suharto as he rose to power. And the military would go out and kill these people as the U.S. CIA would strike their names off the list. Um, and in this way, they killed between a half a million and a million people from 1965 to 1967. That was how the Suharto regime rose to power. In 1975, Indonesian uh, military regime under Suharto, the dictator, and we mustn't confuse the Indonesian people with the Indonesian military. Um, the Indonesian military invaded East Timor. East Timor is a small country about 300 miles north of Australia. It had been occupied by Portugal for more than 400 years. Portugal went through a democratic revolution in 1974. It was disbanding its empire in Africa as well as East Timor. And East Timor was going through a decolonization process. At the end of November 1975, they declared independence. And then on December 7, 1975, just more than a week later, Indonesia, the fourth largest country in the world, invaded East Timor. But they didn't invade before Suharto sat down with then U.S. President Gerald Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who had come to visit Suharto, and got the go-ahead for that invasion. Suharto was concerned that if he launched this clearly offensive um, invasion, uh, that the U.S. would cut off military sales to Indonesia because we have a bilateral agreement with Indonesia that their weapons that they use will not be used for offensive purposes. But once assured that that would not happen, Indonesia invaded by land, by air, by sea, uh, East Timor. First went after um, the capital, Dili, and the thousands of people who live there, dragging thousands of peoples down to the sea and shooting them into it as their loved ones counted them off. Just before the invasion, there were six journalists who were covering the events leading up to the invasion as the Indonesians came over from West Timor, the military, as, uh, and then ultimately had their full-scale invasion on December 7th. And um, there were five journalists in a small town called Balibo, and they lined them up against a house, and they executed them. They cut off their genitals, shoved them in their mouth, and they suffocated to death, death as they shot them. Uh, Indonesia full well knows uh, how serious it is uh, to when word gets out, and so they tried 
very hard not to let word get out about what was happening. In fact, after the invasion of December 7, 1975, they closed East Timor to the outside world for more than a decade as they killed the Timorese inside, killing more than a third.